In this video, we're going to introduce how we can use the virtual work or unit load method to analyze indeterminate trusses. Up till now, we've only been able to analyze trusses that were statically determinate. In the figure here, we have a truss that has some cross bracing, which is characteristic of a structure with some redundancy. And I'm just going to highlight here, we have four joints in the system, but the the two members going through the centre overlap each other but are not joined by a joint in the centre. So if we recall our statics, we had a criteria for whether a truss was indeterminate or not. And that criteria was the degree of indeterminacy D is equal to the number of members plus the number of equations that we can find in statics, which is three in 2D, minus two times the number of joints. So in this case, we have the number of members is one, two, three, four, five, six, plus the three equations minus two times the number of joints. So we have one, two, three, four joints. Let's one, two, three, four joints. We don't have a joint at the center. So two times four is eight. So we have nine minus eight, which equals one. So we're indeterminate by degree one. We have one unknown force that we cannot find due to statics alone. So what we're gonna do is use something called the principle of superposition to help us overcome this problem. So I'm going to scroll down to a picture I've already drawn to keep it neat. So we have the original structure here on the left hand side, what I've called actual structure. And we can split this into two statically determinate structures. So if I remove the member AC, I can have a statically determinate structure, which I've called the primary structure. And this is fully statically determinate. We could use the formula again, but I think it's pretty evident just on inspection that that is statically determinate. And as a result of applying this seven kilonewton load, we're going to get some deflection in this structure. And if we imagine a dotted line, we will have some deflection between A and C that shouldn't exist. And we'll come around how to resolve this problem in a minute. The second indeterminate structure is if we have the same structure as the primary structure, but instead of the seven kilonewton load, that shouldn't be there, we apply a force FAC. And we want to apply just enough force that we remove the residual amount of deflection delta AC and get back to the original position. One little quick note on this method is even with this actual redundant structure, we would still expect some deflection at AC, but we're going to assume that we have no deflection between there. So this equal sign should actually be, for this case, an approximate equal sign for when we have internally redundant structures. We're going to show examples where we have externally redundant structures, where we have too many supports. But when we have an internally redundant structure, this principle of superposition is only approximate. So having said that, we're going to assume that AC does not deflect for this case to get ourselves an approximate answer. And we wish to remove the deflection between A and C. And we're going to write that down. And the mathematical statement we write is something called compatibility. So on the left hand side, we're saying that we want the deflection at AC when we add up the primary and the redundant force structures together to be equal to zero. So that's the zero on the left hand side. So we have the delta AC that occurs in the primary structure. 
So this is the primary. And now we have a force FAC that happens in the redundant structure. And then we have one unknown, which is this component here. So we don't know what the force FAC would be, but we would like to factor up a, or find a way of factoring up such that we do know. So this FAC, FAC here is what we're calling flexibility coefficient. And this flexibility coefficient is now where we use the ideas from the unit load method. So instead of applying our redundant applied force, we'll remember our redundant structure. And exactly the same geometry and exactly the same boundary conditions as we have in our pr primary structure, not to be confused with the real structure, but the primary structure that we've selected. And what we're going to do is apply a unit load where the force FAC would be. And then finally we'll use this formula, the compatibility equation, to factor up the unit load such that we get zero displacement. So by applying the unit load FAC, AC, we will get this flexibility coefficient and the factor by which we need to factor up the flexibility coefficient, so if this is unit load of 1, but actually we need 7 kilonewtons, FAC would be 7 kilonewtons to factor it up. So, and just a quick little note on the notation for the flexibility coefficient. I'm going to write this a little bit larger. So, FAC, and I'm going to leave a little space there. So, the first subscript, AC, it telling us where the deflection is measured. So in this case, we're measuring the deflection that happens between joints A and C. So A and C. And the second subscript now tells us where the unit load has been applied. So in most of the examples we're going to be doing, the deflection will be measured in exactly the same place, same direction as where the unit load has been applied. But you can imagine there are scenarios where you would like to measure the reflection due to a unit load somewhere else. Okay, we're not going to be doing such complicated um, examples in this course. And it's mainly, as we'll show later on, that this method is extremely time consuming and has largely been superseded by the direct stiffness method, which is another method that we were showing in this course. So in the next video, I'm going to show an example of how we proceed to calculate this redundant force FAC. And we're going to use this exact same geometry and loading conditions as shown here. And before we go on to it, the, in the example we're going to show, we have four meters and unsurprisingly, three meters.